everyone. I hope you all enjoy your lunch and the keynote speaker. Uh, my name is Sharon Monroe, and our topic today is going to be embracing fitness agility with Hans Ekman uh, presenting. Hans has proven you can turn mild ADD, OCD, dyslexia, and other personality disorders into an incredible career. <laughs> It's supposed to be guides. I just said it. <laughs> Dyslexia got me. I like the good idea. <laughs> that would be a good idea. Yeah. Um, at SunTrust Bank, he established three different centers of excellence, built successful security services in every team, and was part of two enterprise innovation teams. Hans currently serves as a principal research director at Infotech, the world's fastest growing information technology research and advisory company, proudly serving over 30,000 IT professionals. Thank you so much. Well, out of all the great programmings in this hour block, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, out of curiosity, how many people joined me yesterday for seven tips? Okay, fair number. So there's not a lot of overlap, but there is a little bit, um, but it will feed into this. So one of our challenges we have is we're being told to be more agile. And agile versus a software methodology, agile versus a culture, what does that mean? And what I want to focus in here today is exclusively on how do we adapt agility and the need for agility into our businesses? Because the days of being able to create 5, 10, 20 year roadmaps and knowing where companies were going and having that stability are long gone. So we have to become more nimble and that's what we're going to focus in on today. So first, before we can talk about business agility, we need to figure out what we're talking about. Next, how can we talk about agility and delivering value if we don't define what value is and how it works? <coughs> We're going to talk about some of the cultural changes that are going to need to happen for our companies to evolve and become more business agile. And then I want to introduce you to the Cunovan network, uh, excuse me, Cunovan framework, which is a way of looking at different areas of your organization, different um, challenges, and determining where agility may be able to help you the most. Sound good? Okay, so what do we mean by agility? So if I say agility, what am I talking about? Just in general, what does it mean to you? Yes? To be very adaptable, flexible. Okay, adaptable, flexible, what else? Iterative. Iterative, excellent. Yeah. Continuous adjustment and improvement. Okay, continuous adjustment and improvement. So a lot of times when we're dealing with terms that we all kind of think we know, but each of us has our own definition and own criteria, we want to try and center in and come up with a common language. And when we're doing cultural change, one of the most important things to start with is understanding the language and what it means so that everyone in your organization aligns accordingly. So let's look at two examples. When we talk about agility in sports, what we're really talking about is the ability to respond to changing conditions and to either react to a threat or take advantage of an opportunity. So this is a very proactive. We're constantly looking, monitoring, and then we're adapting as we see things. If we look at animal agility, I love dog agility and dog agility courses, we're actually talking about the ability for our, the dog to respond not only to their environment and follow set patterns, but also to respond to commands. So when you look at the agility, how the course is laid out is always different. It's not like the dog has been training on that exact one, but they have certain patterns, they know how to go through certain obstacles, but what obstacles in which way in which order changes. Well, this becomes a perfect metaphor for our organizations because when we look at any of our strategic changes, any of our projects, anything dealing with change, we're really looking at sports. What are the threats we need to adapt to? What are the opportunities we can take advantage of? When we look at canine agility, we're looking at more of our operational teams. We have people and processes in place. How quickly can they apply the right pattern, the right process, the right tools to complete that particular work? I want to really simplify it for business agility though. And let's drill down to just two specific areas. One, we're trying to deliver value quickly. And we're trying to deliver value faster. I, don't, I haven't heard any company saying, well, I'm really interested in making changes so that we can do a lot less work and a lot less productivity and a lot less value and we're going to spend more and take longer to do. We're trying to deliver that value sooner. And we need to be able to respond to changes, threats, opportunities quicker. So 
Can I get value out sooner? Am I more equipped to deal with changes in my organization? Very simple approach, but it'll let us focus in on. Let's look at two companies who are absolutely crushing it in this arena. The first is Amazon. If you think of Amazon and the entire Amazon ecosystem, there are so many moving parts. And one of the things they realized was they needed to be able to push out changes very quickly into different areas faster to see what worked and what didn't work. And on average, their IT groups are pushing out production code changes every 11.7 seconds. <coughs> Pretty fast. Now, does that mean each one of our teams would be pushing out changes every 11 seconds? Absolutely not. But somewhere in their environment, based on the number of releases, on average, every 11.7 seconds, something is changing. I could change an algorithm in terms of what's recommended. I could be changing which product, products are promoted. I could be t testing on a specific market new shipping paradigms or new shipping methods. I could be testing promotions. There's all these different things in their environment. And that's actually where Amazon Web Services developed. When they knew they needed to constantly tune and improve and respond to changes in their storefront, they said, our, our old way of doing things, our old way of delivering software won't work. So let's build a cloud environment that allows us to dynamically provision environments, push changes to market segments, geographies, different areas safely, and if something crashes, give me the ability to restore back to where it was in a click of the mouse. That, and, uh, Amazon Web Services has worked so well, Amazon actually makes more profit off of AWS than they do all of their store products. I'm going to say that again. They developed an internal hosting tool because it, they needed it for their business. They thought it was so good they decided to bring that product to market and it now has more profit than everything sold on the Amazon website. So, you never know what your business model might be. But we still think of Amazon as a storefront, and now adding other services, who knows what the next best thing is. Netflix took a little bit different approach. What is the worst thing that happens when you're watching Netflix? The buffer, the little spinning, I can't, you know, you're waiting for it to load, little service interruptions. Netflix knew that service quality had to be even more important than their program. Because no matter how good the programming was, if there were interruptions, people would get frustrated. I discontinued Hulu early on because of that frustration. I just couldn't stand the service quality and gave it up and haven't gone back to it yet. Now that they've fixed it, maybe I'll try it again. So Netflix created an automated set of programs called their Simeon Army, who goes out and actually tests their network, tests different capabilities, tests and monitors what's going on so that it can dynamically adjust to demand and identify problems before they happen. You may not know, but Netflix actually purchases at their cost and puts media servers in local ISPs all across the world. And they cache the shows that are in the highest demand locally so it doesn't have to go all the way across the internet, it doesn't generate bandwidth costs, and Netflix uses Amazon Web Services for all their cloud hosting <laughs> so they don't have to pay AWS fees if it's on their own local server. So for them, it's a much better way. Simeon Army may detect if I told you about a show that I love, like right now I am completely and totally obsessed with The Good Life, and I'm probably gonna re-binge it uh, this weekend. If I told you about that, and then we all told people, and then all of a sudden everyone's going back and watching The Good Life, they would actually see that in the locality and start caching that show in the ISP to reduce network traffic. So some examples of how we can set up an environment that actually either manually or dynamically responds to change and make us more dynamic. So let's take a look at value. If we're really going to deliver value sooner, we need to agree as to what value is. The first thing's kind of easy, consumer value. First thing, I need to increase the value of goods or services provided. Value is the only reason we make purchases. It's not price, it's not need, it's not demand. It's only value. Is there enough value in what I'm purchasing that it's worth my time, my risk, or my money to have that? And every time I make a purchase, there's a transactional risk. Am I gonna have to return it? Is it going to break? Am I going to like it? Um, what's going to happen if I get a new toy? Is everyone else in my family now gonna want a new toy? And now it's gonna cost me more money to get them all toys. 
These are the things that we need to think about in terms of consumer value. Can we reduce transactional risk? Walmart discovered that when it came to media buys, um, in the old days, CDs and movies, if the price was $10 or lower, and this was when most movies were $15 to $20, if they could price something at $10 or lower, we would buy it without thinking. The impulse buy kicked in at $10, which is why for the longest time and across their shelved movies, almost all their movies are $8.88. We're willing to throw eight bucks at a movie we might watch once or twice rather than just streaming it. It's also why they have the discount bid. Online, that threshold Amazon discovered was about $50. Anything priced more than $50 as an individual item, we're going to stop and think about or consider alternatives before making that purchase. But there's more to this ecosystem. Our customers isn't the only thing. We also need to think about our employees. Because our employees are the ones who are actually delivering on the value and can make or break our company. If you don't believe it, look at the customer satisfaction by airline over the last 50 years. Pan Am, Eastern, gone. United used to be top. They are now fighting Sprint to be the worst airline ever. And it's because they have put in policies that people don't want to break, so now employees are afraid to act for fear of repercussions. Delta, horrible customer service, went through bankruptcy, came out of it, and became extremely customer focused. And now they are ranking in the top of all airlines for customer satisfaction. They are the only airline that did not force bump a passenger all in the last year. Because their employees are empowered to offer enough money until everyone finally does it voluntarily. And so far the record is $8,000 that they've paid to get somebody to drop a ticket. It was a trip to Hawaii and a family of four made $32,000 to take a flight the next day. They made $4,000 the next day to do the same thing again and went on a really nice vacation paid for by Delta. <laughs> Great customer service, now that's a story. These are the opportunities. So we want to improve, improve employee satisfaction. We want to help reduce errors because does anyone really enjoy making a mistake at work? Does anyone love the bad feeling, the embarrassment of Oops, I made a mistake. But think how many times it happens. What if our processes and tools and support network could reduce that? Wouldn't we feel better about coming to work, less nervous? And then the final one is helping improve throughput. Can we achieve the same value, the same work for less effort? I would love to deliver more value for less work. Like think how cool that would be, is to work less, not work as hard, and still deliver the same value or use that buffer time to deliver something else that maybe is like the Google Flex time, where then I can use and develop something else. But we're missing a cornerstone. We talked about customers, we talked about employers. Who else are we missing? What other group or groups are critical to our company's success? Stockholders? No, they're irrelevant. <laughs> Thank you for answering. No, I was hoping someone would. No, the, uh, if I'm, a, if I'm looking to work at a company and one of their focuses um, is delivering sh shareholder value, I'm not working for them. If you build a good company, shareholders will follow. Yeah. What about management? I would put them in employee value. Under employee. Yeah. Okay. How often do we forget our partners and our vendors? Does anyone have a company that operates completely in isolation without having to rely on any partners, any vendors, any outside company? And if so, I want to know where you get your power and water from. <laughs> or sanitation, which would be even worse. Like, I, I believe in a closed ecosystem. If you've got a company that doesn't do anything, wow. So for them, it's almost like a customer value. They do business with us because they're getting value out of it. We can increase their value without decreasing ours necessarily. When I was running a security services group, we partnered with several firms to deliver in areas that were new to us. And we truly partnered. We didn't just say, we're going to be your strategic partner. We actually brought those companies in. And they sat side by side with our team. And there was no distinction in anything we did between employees, contractors, offshore, vendor resources. We all operated as one team with the same goals, participated in the same monthly meetings, the same quarterly meetings. There was no isolation because we were either going to be successful or flounder together. All right, yes, sir. 
Um, <coughs> just going back to that yep. about the partner value, are you saying that like my company has a responsibility to make the goods or values that I'm receiving from my vendors better? Yes, absolutely. Because if you can create a value proposition that works for your vendor, they're probably going to do better work. The partnership and the investment you're making is going to last longer. And it has to be a mutual value. You're not, if you aren't getting the value, you're not going to keep them around. But if they aren't getting the value, then they're not going to stick around. And without naming names, just imagine that there was a great big home improvement company that happened to be very orange. And they knew they were the biggest bully on the block. And so what they did was they continually squeezed their partners and their vendors to get the most value for them, forcing them to do inventory, them to do counts, them to do stocking all at their cost, and squeezing their margin down and down and down. Eventually they left, and Lowe's took over as a, grew rapidly and grew in appreciation. They've since changed a lot of those philosophies. But if you're mean to your customers, if you're mean to your partners, the good ones are going to go away, and you're only going to be left with lousy partners. But it, it does have to be mutually <coughs> beneficial. Yep. And we often, and the reason I mention that is we really don't think in those terms. Like our whole goal, our sourcing department, number one goal, make sure that we can back out of the agreement if they don't perform. <laughs> and make sure and cut them down so they have the minimum possible profit. When I, used, I found out from sourcing what they were looking for in legal, and I would actually work with the vendors ahead of time to prepare their proposal to meet our, meet our constraints. And if they couldn't, that's fine. I'm just going to go somewhere else. So I knew sourcing was required to get at least a 10% cut on the quoted price, or they can't accept the offer. Hmm, I wonder if every quote was 10% higher. We agreed what we were willing to pay, what would be good for them. Even we had a solution architect, a solution architect who couldn't do the travel anymore. And we worked, I worked with their company and said, I will raise your hourly rate for this resource so that you can pay that person more. We will reduce travel to one week per month, and we will set up a dedicated video conferencing room for them to work so that they can be with their family. We need them. So I was willing to pay extra and provide the equipment, whatever we needed to do to make that happen. And it, it had value. We needed that person. Ultimately, for other reasons, it just didn't work out. They needed a break from us and the company they were working for, so it didn't quite work out. Our project suffered. We, we had a six-month setback because we couldn't get that one resource. So think about that. Wouldn't you pay a little bit extra to not have a six month delay on your project, that's where the partner and vendor value comes in. Great question, thank you. Okay, so those of you who were here yesterday, no cheating, we're gonna get some of the newbies in here. I need your help. We all know what a minimum viable product is, so help me understand. If you're gonna go back after this conference and explain what MVPs are to your teams, what would you say? How would you describe an MVP? What would an MVP look like? Basic functionality, okay, so it's some sort of minimum. Excellent. With the first real release of a, of a end -end solution. Okay, first release. Does it have to be for a customer to use? I see some nods, yes, so it could be. Depends on what it is. Depends on what it is. Okay, so there's no value unless a customer uses it. What if a user used it, but an internal user? For example, Microsoft internally releases all their software for six months before releasing it to the public. Then they release it for three months for a special user group to test it out before it hits main market. So could an MVP be for an internal group of users to react to? Could it be a prototype? Could it be a proof of concept? To, it doesn't even work, but we're going to try several different ways and figure out which one would work. Okay. Okay. So because you're looking for feedback. Yeah. 
I suspect of her. <laughs> I appreciate you have you challenging. And that is that is productive conflict. So depending on your culture, it could be that you define MVP as it has to be an externally facing. But the key is we've got to define and agree to what an MVP means. So it's very valid that that could be true, but we also need to recognize maybe there are other, um, there are other definitions we have to be aware of. So let's look at it in terms of building a car. So we want to build a car. That's our goal. That's our MVP is we know a car has wheels. We have to hold the wheels together with some sort of a frame. We need to have a chassis so that we can be protected. And by the time, it isn't until the very end when I've assembled the whole car, do I potentially know whether or not I wanted a car or not, or what kind of car I wanted, or what features. We thought we knew, but at the end, is that really it? Because this is the first time I can tell whether or not our customers or our users are happy. We can't necessarily, we don't necessarily want to change what we think is going to be the outcome. But can we reframe what we're trying to accomplish? What if instead we define this as a transportation problem, a transportation goal? What's a skateboard? What's something that will let me go a little bit faster? But I need a little more control. Let's put a handle on it. What would the scooter look like? Now I want to go faster or carry more weight. What would the bicycle look like? I'm tired of pedaling. Let's put a motor on it. What would the motorcycle look like? And by the time I get to this car, I actually have potentially a bigger and a better and a more tested and a more validated car, even if I deliver both cars on the exact same day. Because I've learned all of these lessons along the way. I've learned all about what our users wanted, what's important, and I may or may not be able to reuse those products. I may have other products that I develop. I, they may all be throw away, but either way, I've learned along the way. And so we need to start thinking in simple terms that an MVP are these steps along the way towards our desired outcome, not just a set of features. If we look at that and say, OK, well, what happens over time? So the first thing is, imagine every hour of effort delivered an hour of value or some sort of multiplier of value. What if every dollar we spent delivered some dollar value of return? I could actually ideally create a straight line that would perfectly map to everything we put in, we're getting tangible value up. Now, is that reality? No. We have waste. We have loss. We have a lot of pre-work that goes in. And that's what ends up happening when we develop the car. We do our analysis and our planning and our prioritization, and then we start doing design, and then we start building. And we're doing all this work, and we really haven't gotten anywhere close to delivering anything. It isn't until I start testing and validating with my users, with my audience, with our teams to see what we're capable of doing that I start learning lessons, and that has value, and I get closer to the line. But I don't hit that maximum value line until I have a car I can drive and test. Now, I could try and fight and change the shape of that curve. I could try and do validation maybe a little earlier to make it flatter. But it's so much easier simply reduce reducing the iterations. If I, in that same time, have five releases instead, I can learn those lessons along the way and map it to my MVP route. And I've still got the same shape, but because I'm testing and validating sooner, I hit that minimum value line more frequently. And every time I hit the line is a time where I'm delivering tangible value to the organization. So, mystery of Agile and DevOps and the universe and business agility, I don't have to change the way we work. I just have to change the duration of the delivery of the work we're doing. If I can come up with more increments, smaller increments, more phases, more releases, I automatically deliver value. And it's the difference, in, it's the difference between these two lines. That's how much more value I'm gaining simply by implementing more times. And maybe we're not a value-based organization, maybe we're risk-based. And it looks the same thing. As we're going along, we continue to build up risk. We're putting in effort, we're spending money, we're burning time, we're making decisions. And it isn't until I start validating that I know whether or not that's going to deliver the end value. But it's not until I deliver the car and drive it for the first time that I've dissipated that risk. Imagine if we decided to stop the project anywhere along here. All of this effort is now lost. All that accumulated risk is now burnt. 
And again, all I have to do is if I can reproduce that same pattern, but in smaller increments, look at the amount of risk I've reduced by simply mapping it out to an MVP and reducing that risk along the way. Because it isn't just the risk of everything we've put into it, but it's the risk of what we're not doing or choosing not to do instead. Right now, you all have the ability to be here and you're not doing your jobs. You're not doing your other work. Every hour you're spending here is work that's not getting done somewhere else. It's the same thing in the project world. When we decide to fund and prioritize one effort, we're choosing not to do other work because we believe it's going to have more value. And that's a good thing. You're gaining far more value here than I think you would probably deliver on a normal work day because everyone you take these lessons back to, you're gonna end up influencing and you're gonna get a multiplier of value back. So look at it not only from the risk and accumulation of what you're doing, but the cost of the things you're deciding not to do as well. And we look at it, why, you know, a couple quick reasons, a little more detail about why smaller increments work. First thing is, the smaller the increments, the faster I can respond to change. If we made a rule that says we won't change anything in a cycle, and my cycles are smaller, I can change things within each cycle, and the cycles are coming sooner, it gives me more chance to learn. It also gives me more opportunity to manage risk. By reducing the accumulated risk, I'm not as tied in to moving forward with a project that may be a loser. And my personal loser project here was a Ford Bronco. I decided I was gonna restore a 1984 Ford Bronco. And it started off great, I had a buddy to help me, but then we had an unforeseen disruption and had to pause the project. When we took it up, the engine had rusted and I had to replace the engine. But I didn't have that much money into it. So I was like, okay, I'll get that fixed. But he's busy, so I'll have to take it into a shop and I'll have them put the new engine in. And there's some other work that they found that they need to do. But I've already got this much money invested into, what's another 2,000? What's another 2,000? And so my $2,000 project is now sitting at $12,000 and I still don't have a driving vehicle. But because I accumulated all that risk, I didn't want to give it up, and I ended up losing more money because I didn't do it in increments, I didn't have a good place where I could quit and recover my investment or minimize my loss. Mm -hmm. The last is accelerating value. The more times I can hit the dotted green line, the more times I can ship and validate, the more value I'm delivering to the organization. So there's a lot of different ways we can express this. And you can download from the website or from my site. I've got business cards up here. You can download and review some of the details. And if you have questions, always feel free to reach out to me anytime. All right, but how do we become business agile? So we know some of the things we're gonna to need to do, but how are we gonna do it? First, let's steal some ideas from the Agile Manifesto because it really does address a cultural way of doing things. So the first, only work on things that deliver value to your end customers. That sounds hard because we have a lot of keep the lights on opportunity, but if you have a choice of tasks to work on, pick the ones that are delivering the most value to your end users. Second, we need to limit work in progress. Work in progress has no value. So before you start something new, look through everything you have to do and what can I finish? What can I ship? What can I finish? What can I ship? Start there. What can I move forward so soon I can finish it? And only when I've finished everything in process and moved it as far forward as I can, do I bring something else into my work queue. If you want to learn more about that, read up on Kanban. Kanban does a phenomenal job of talking about why <coughs> work in progress limits work. I've also got some slides I can send you independently if you're more interested about that. And Agile really prescribes on delivering smaller pieces of work that can be validated and pushed out quickly. So we want to adopt that as well. But we also need to look at our management practices because monolithic command and control structures go against business agility. It's going to make things really hard. So one of the first things we need is we need management to empower self-managing teams. Again, from a management or a leadership standpoint, if you're gonna focus and take one thing away here, come up with consistent definitions of ready and done. If we can't agree when done is done, how do we ever know we're done? And I think more project delays, slippage, arguments come from not having a consistent definition of done. 
But the flip to that is, if I'm taking in work, I have to be able to define when that's ready for me to take on. I don't want to take on work that isn't ready. Imagine if we ran a bakery and you were in the front selling cakes that were half baked. They're not ready. You're, just because someone's asking for it and you didn't have the one ready to go, you're not going to take it uncooked out of the oven, hand it to them and say, here you go. It wasn't ready, but it's done. <laughs> but that's what we do in projects all the time. And we really need to not just claim to be servant leaders and employ servant leadership, but we need to really true and truly evolve into servant leadership. Okay, so how many people here would identify prim primarily as a project manager? Okay, you're not going to like me for the next couple slides. I don't like you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> then your expectations will remain fulfilled. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so let's look at a typical life cycle. So we get together for annual planning. We initiate our projects. We manage the projects. We implement the projects. And then we rinse and repeat and we do this cycle over and over again and can't understand why we keep getting the same insufficient results. Because we follow this, it makes sense, it's stable, it's predictable, it's just not generating value and not timely value. And that's because most of our projects manage scope, resources, and time. We know what needs to get done in what order, who's going to do it, and when they're going to do this. And this is where I really have low tolerance with bad project managers. Because bad project managers think that this man means that they manage scope, schedule, and blame. Task, schedule, and blame. I know who was supposed to do what, and when it doesn't get done, I know who to yell at, and then find out, well, when is it going to get done, and did you know you're keeping the whole side of this room busy? They can't do their work because you all did not finish your task on time. I will take the best facilitator, project manager, over the, excuse me, the worst facilitator over the best task, schedule, and blame manager any day of the week. And that's because, again, we're missing servant leadership. So we've mentioned servant leadership, but we haven't defined it. And I keep saying we've got to have common definitions. We've got to define it. Servant leadership. The bad way of doing this, and think in your head, the managers, the directors, the senior leadership, your project manager, who said, hey, this is my project to deliver. This is my reputation. You're going to do this because this is my responsibility to get done. That is blame-based management. It is not effective if you want to be agile. Instead, we need people who realize that I am responsible for supporting the team that is going to deliver the value. I am a servant to that team to make sure that they are successful. If you hear, I firmly believe, if you hear somebody say, I am a servant leader, they are not. Because anyone who is a servant leader, by nature of that culture, would never claim to be that out loud. They would know that they either are or aren't, and they have to demonstrate it. Because what they're doing is, instead of managing all these things, they're facilitating. What can I do to make all of you successful? What are some of the things you'll need to be successful? What are some of the obstacles I need to clear out of your way so that you can deliver the value? Because the people closest to the problem are often the best ones to solve it. And that's where we need to. It's my job, if you all were the team, it's my job to make sure that you are completely successful by getting those obstacles out of your way, helping you be successful, getting you the support you needed regardless of what it is. Anytime we can break something complicated down into three parts, we're more likely to remember and being able to implement it. So there's three core pillars to servant leadership. The first, I gotta support the team. First and foremost, what does that team need to be successful? And probably most importantly, how can I run interference so that managers, other teams, are not disrupting our team with silly requests, confusing messaging, helicopter management. We need to act as a buffer for our teams. I need to empower the team, which truly means helping them make better decisions and support the decisions they make, and trusting those decisions. And finally, I want to listen to understand, not listen to respond. And if anyone's been in a relationship, nothing will save you faster than this. 
And I learned this by accident when I was in yet early on in my marriage. We are very much opposites. And I realized how, let me, how do I phrase this? <laughs> how often my poor spouse just simply could not understand some of the basic things I was telling her. Because I would tell her what the right thing was, but she would continue to argue with me and say the same thing over and over again. And then one time I started getting really frustrated. I was like, there's no way. She is not stupid. And I was like, wait a minute. If she's doing the same thing I'm doing to her, and she keeps telling me something, it's because she doesn't think I heard what she said. And truthfully, I haven't really been listening. I just know I was right and needed to win the argument, which I've never won an argument in our relationship. And I started listening, not to respond, but to understand and said, listen, is this what you're trying to say? OK, let me consider that. I don't know how to change that. I don't know how to fix it, but let me do that. That started a change, and it has built year after year after year. And every year gets better. Every year gets stronger. Because most of the time, we are list truly listening to understand. Some of us do it better than others. <laughs> Next, we need to get in better practice of taking things offline. We heard Paul talk about this a lot. When you have issues, pull people aside, pull teams aside. Make sure that you're talking about the right issues at the right time with the right people. Stop solutioning during our meetings. Stop solutioning during status meetings or stand-ups. It's a stand-up. What did you get done? What are you working on next? What are your blockers? I'm done. And guess what? Don't share anything that doesn't affect anyone else. I don't care what you're having for lunch. It doesn't affect me unless we're having a team lunch. And even then, I don't know that it affects me. So please, stop solutioning in your stand-up meetings. How do, you, how do you address that? That's one of the, I find that's one of the biggest problems. That's one. So I just had to do that with our team. Because we have gone from three stand-ups to now daily stand-ups. And none of the people on my team, rarely do we ever do anything that impacts anyone else. And I, I brought it up on one of our discussions. I said, guys, we're wasting our time. What is the purpose of me sharing what I'm working on? If none of you are going to support it, none of you are going to view it, it doesn't have anything to do with it, and I really don't care what you're working on. Can we focus in on, let's set the ground <coughs> rules for each of these meetings. What is important? If I have calls and I need help with calls or call coverage, that impacts the team. Let's talk about it. If I have a blocker or there's something I need help, let's identify it so I can take it offline. And then bringing up, hey, I think we had a good meeting, but for our next one, let's see if we can focus more on those things that actually impact the team or that are part of the process that feeds the team. They will get better because nobody wants to waste their time. And if there needs to be a forum where people have a chance to solution or discuss, set up another meeting and make it an, we're going to have a one hour a week open forum to talk about all these things because this isn't the right meeting. But it is important. It's important to you. It's important to us. Let's pull a separate meeting for that and those types of topics. And we did it, and it's, it, it's getting better. We're not there yet. When I was managing a, the security services delivery team, I implemented a rule because we had an extremely command and control structure. And a decision was only made three levels, sometimes two levels, above your job grade. And that was a general rule at the bank. So I implemented a new one for our team. Don't ever come to me with a problem or ask for a decision. Come to me with an explanation of what it is. Make sure you've thoroughly looked at it and researched it. I want three recommendations, and I want, excuse me, three options and your recommendation. Using Decision Poker, uh, look it up, Management 2.0 Decision Poker, depending on the type of decision, I would fully delegate, and they would be empowered to do that on their own. I might advise them and let them make the decision. Or I might have information that the team didn't have, so I may take their advice and influence their decision. But I tried to push as many down empowering the team to the team. At the end of the day, we never went with a decision that the team didn't recommend. We would discuss it. We would come up with one. We always went with the team decision the team selected because they were the ones who had to implement it. They were closest to the problem. They were on the hook. It's not my call. 
And then I defended them if that decision didn't work. So it was my decision to support their decision, so management yelled at me, and I ran interference. I made the decision, I supported their selection, that's what we went with. If you have issues with it, I'm the one you want to have. You're not yelling at my team. They made the right choice based on the information they had. Okay, so when we're changing our culture here, we also need to change our task management. So right now, we estimate, we schedule, we link the tasks, we monitor, and we update. Again, this is bad project management. Instead, consider a technique in Switch by Dan and Chip Heath. Imagine what success would look like. Imagine writing a postcard to ourselves from the future and describing what that would look like. Then, script the critical steps that have to happen. What are the things that we would have to do to reach that destination? Now our teams will constantly align on that destination, on that goal, on that objective. We will know the things that have to get done, and we'll continue to self-align on how to get those done. We also need to break things down into smaller time boxes and sprints. Again, smaller iterations reduce risk. So I'm going to push ahead a little bit because I want to make sure we have time to discuss the Cunovan network. The hardest part of the Cunovan framework is pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> it's down at the bottom. I've had to rehearse this a lot of times. There are some really good uh, TED videos, um, a great Wikipedia overview. There's also a lot of other frameworks, so you may have one that you like better, but this was introduced to me by uh, Ryland, who actually helped me co-develop an earlier version of this presentation, and I've really latched onto it. There's four quadrants, four different states we find. If we are in a simple environment, it's where we have known knowns. These are our day-to-day -day operations. We know what we're doing, we just have to find the right process to apply at the right time. Kind of like our animal agility. So this is our best practice. I sense, I categorize it, and then I just carry out the work. Would iterations, more iterations, would more business agility help us out in a best practice environment? Maybe, probably not, because I already know what to do. So I really don't have to worry about cycle time. I just see what needs to be done, I follow the process and I do it, so there's really not much to iterate on. When I get into a complicated environment, and this is where a lot of our projects start, I have known unknowns. I know the things I'm gonna have to discover and define and figure out. I have my requirements plan, I know what we're gonna need to do, I know how we're gonna validate the design, but I'm not sure. So in this case, iterations and agility is helpful because it helps me reduce the risks as I'm defining those unknowns. Now where shorter iterations becomes great or ideal is when we're in a complex environment. And this is where we have unknown unknowns. I don't know what I don't know. So I've got to probe. I've got to sense what happens when I probe, and then I've got to respond. So the shorter the iterations, the faster I can learn. If you go back to your offices on Monday, and suddenly there's a new competitor, like Uber and Lyft did to the taxi industry, now they're in a complex environment. They need to figure out, is this a threat? How are we going to respond? What are we going to do? Are we going to sue? Are we going to try and get legislation? Are we going to adapt to their model and do that? So a complex, if you find yourself where you have a lot of unknown unknowns, this is an ideal place for shrinking iterations and really promoting more of an agile ag business agility approach. Sometimes we find ourselves in a chaotic environment. And if I'm in a chaotic environment, this is really where it's panic. Like, if there's something disruptive, there's something we weren't expecting, this is panic mode for our teams. And what we need to do is, we do something, we see what happened, and then we respond based on whatever we observe happened. So, in this place, iterations and agility isn't going to help us because we aren't even stable enough to pattern it out. So instead, my whole goal here is, I want to turn this clock clockwise. That's an analogy I'll only be able to use for a few more years, thanks to iWatch and digital technologies, but we want to go clockwise, and we need to move chaotic to complex. If I can stabilize enough that I have unknown unknowns, then I can start doing cycles and figure out what to do. If I have unknown unknowns, but I can start to define them, so now that they're known unknowns, now, even more, I can now use a more systematic approach. Maybe I lengthen my time boxes. Maybe I take a more, system, uh, a more calculated approach. 
And ideally, I want to take complicated and I want to push it into best practice. The minute I can get rid of any of my unknowns and put it into business as usual, it's going to be much easier, like time cards. We all track time, but if I have a standard time reporting system for our pro projects or our products, and I just put in the time and it reports and does all that for me, I don't really have unknowns. It's just a question of collecting data and analyzing it. So my whole goal here is to push things around. So we've hit the two minute mark, um, and we're actually going to be stopping on time despite getting a late start with the keynote. We'll give you five minutes. Okay. okay. So I will also be available and I'll hang out for some additional questions. But what I'd like your help with is, what was something you saw here that really had an impact for you, had a value, something that you may want to adopt or consider? What's something that made this hour of your life provide value and make this worth your time? Destination postcard. Fantastic. What, how, do you, how, do you, how do you intend to do this? Did I give you this one yesterday? No. Excellent. Congratulations. Thanks for participating. <laughs> so um, how would you apply destination postcards? Um, my, well, to try to make, keep it short, I, I'm working on a waterfall project that's two years late. Um, and I think, so I, I think I, I'd like to come up with some of the ideas of coming to the team and say, what do you imagine this yeah. completed application is going to look like? And what do you think it should look like? Fantastic. Um, when you're in a situation like that, I highly recommend reading Switch. Um, whoops, sorry, that was a laser. Um, it is amazing. It's the best organizational change book. They actually talk a bit about outcomes-based therapy, that as a therapeutic practice, if we envision, like, if suddenly we woke up Monday and all our problems went away, what would be the first thing we noticed? How would we notice that our problems had gone away? Now, can I change my environment or what I'm doing to make it seem like my problem went away? And it actually works. It's one of the most effective therapy techniques. And destination postcard is adapting that to our business lives. So find a pattern that works, adapt it to something else. Thank you. Yes? Thank you. Um, this, is, this is a huge one. Um, I think we beat that one up. So hopefully that. You had one minute. Awesome. Did you? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. um, um, mine was uh, only when one thing to deliver value under uh, the sensibility yeah. of the been working on a big agile project. Well, it wasn't agile to begin with, and then they decided halfway through, let's go agile, but we're actually doing waterfall with thoughts of agile. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's been hard to pick up and. Did you join me yesterday? No, I didn't. Okay. Ping me, grab one of my cards. Okay. I'll make sure that you've got a link to yesterday's presentation. It specifically addresses hybrid methodologies. That that's one of the key lessons. Sometimes water scrum fall is the best way to go. Analysis design and planning that's linear, iterations for development and unit testing, and then we hand off. That can be a great transition for organizations that are struggling. Um, so remind me of that, and there's some other assets I could do. I will have a video of both of these posted hopefully within two weeks, thanks to Dan. Um, and so those will be on the website. Also, if you grab the green card, that one is mine. Um, all of the presentations that I do are available absolutely free for download on, on the site. Just go to presentation topics. And wherever possible, I actually have a video from previous conference presentations. Um, these two from today's will be updated or are actually missing because I haven't had a good recording. So they're all available. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I honestly mean that. I will do whatever I can to help you and make you be successful. Almost nobody will take me up on that, but the people who do, I think I really do help them and deliver value, so please don't be that person. Daniel? I'm going to go ahead and attest to that. I met Hans uh, about a year and a half ago, and he's been nothing but a great help. Our little okay. repertoire is just to uh, have some fun in the uh, presentation. Absolutely. So I'm going to pause here. If anyone had anything else, Please come up. Um, I'm going to start shutting down to make room so the next person gets set up. Thank you so much. If you love the session, please fill out the evaluation. My name was Hans Ekman. If you hated it, my name was Vince. Thank you so much.